Uh, we started some time ago trying to answer a question that was in the question box back there. I appreciate people who put uh, sermon suggestions or questions they have. Uh, they'd like to hear more from the Bible about this or that subject. And one good question that was asked was, you know, what are the blessings that come with being a Christian? And we said that, well, the short answer to that is, well, you get to go to heaven and you get to miss hell. But I think there's a lot more to it than that. That's pretty great. But I think there's a lot more detailed answer given in Scripture, and we can't exhaust that subject, though it may seem like we've tried. But in Ephesians, I think we have a good bit about that idea of being, he says in 1-3, all spiritual blessings are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What's the blessing in being a Christian? Well, in the first place, you become part of the family of God. As was mentioned already this morning, that's a great thing, to be a part of God's family. Uh, that involves the care of a heavenly father. It involves the discipline that comes with being a father, a son, and a part of the family of God. It also involves the idea of being redeemed. That's what uh, 1 7 uh, tells us that we have redemption in Christ. And that word redemption is a word, as we looked at in a previous lesson, which means to ransom. You know, our life is off the rails, it's wasted. We're headed nowhere, well, we're headed really for destruction, but we're doing nothing of value. We're, we're wasting the life that God has given us until Christ comes and pays the ransom so that we might get back on the road and that we might be useful in Christ. Uh, in, in chapter 3 and in verse 10, I believe it is, where he talks about how that uh, we are uh, called, um, no, it's 2.10, I'm sorry that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto, he says, good works which God before ordained that we should walk in them. We become now useful in the hand of God to do his work. Our life has meaning and purpose. We've already preached that lesson. Today I want to finish up this thought by emphasizing more this idea of, of forgiveness. Back in 1.7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The redemption was made possible by the forgiveness that, that uh, is involved in it. We are forgiven by God. And we talked in the last lesson about what forgiveness is. Forgiveness literally means to send away. It's the idea of separating us from the stain and the guilt of sin. And we talked about uh, the words that are used by the Holy Spirit to describe forgiveness, remission, as in a disease. That's the picture there of someone whose disease now of sin is in remission. They are, they are separated from it. Our sins are blotted out, Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. And we talked about how that seems like almost an outdated uh, figure, but the picture is of writing in the ink and then someone taking some solution and, and erasing we're familiar with erasing with a pencil or with a blackboard, or it might be, or maybe with a hard drive being erased. But that's the idea of our sins being erased, blotted out, removed from the record. Our sins are washed away, Acts 22 and verse 16. Like you go to the beach and you write something in the sand, but then the water comes and washes it away, erases it, and it's gone. And that's the very terminology the Bible uses about baptism. It saves us. It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's the answer of a good conscience or the appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here's the picture of being forgiven. and What a blessing that is. Finally, in Hebrews chapter 13, we looked at this passage in an earlier lesson, Hebrews 8, rather, I'm sorry, in verse 12, where the Lord says that I will remember your sins no more. The last time we talked about memory and how memory can be a very painful thing. Uh, but when God says, I remember your sins no more, then we can work to forget those sins. I don't guess we ever get over our rebellion. But we no longer allow it to weight us down to keep us from going forward because we know that God has removed that guilt from us. And what a blessing that is. Today, I want to think with you just a moment again about this idea of forgiveness and the basis of that forgiveness. To be bought back or redeemed, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 1, 
to be saved from waste, to be made useful to God is only made possible by the fact that our slate has been wiped clean and our debt is paid. But how can that be? How can a just God look at a sinner like Wes Brown and say, forgive him, he's justified? How is that possible? It's possible by the blood of Christ. Notice again in Ephesians 1, 7. In whom, Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood. And I don't think our study can be complete until we emphasize that point that we are forgiven, but what an awful price was paid for our forgiveness. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, uh, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for every one. The word that was with God became flesh. And uh, because he was willing to do that, and because he came to do that so that he might be able to die for man and the sins of man, he tasted death for every one of us. You know, I remember hearing a debate once between two brethren, uh, and the question was, and I wish I could, could remember the exact proposition, I don't want to get it wrong, but anyway, one of these brethren was arguing that uh, Jesus didn't uh, take the penalty of our sin. You know, he didn't, he didn't die for my sins. I, and I thought, boy, I'll tell you what, I, it's going to take me a long time to even begin to understand that. How in the world is that possible? You could miss it that badly. Have you ever read it, Isaiah uh, chapter 53? I know this audience has, but let's go there again. And let's look at the language of Isaiah chapter 53, because I think the very point that he makes there is that Christ came to take on the penalty for my sin. Isaiah 53 and verse 3. He is despised and rejected. This great servant of God is despised and rejected. He is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. We thought somehow he was the problem. <laughs> He was despised and we esteemed him not, but verse 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. If we looked at him and thought he was ugly, it was our ugliness that he was carrying. It was our punishment that he was bearing. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace that made my peace with God possible, that was what he was paying, that price. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ bore the penalty of my sin. That's why he came. His perfect life was to make it possible for him to be a fit sacrifice. A sinner like me couldn't die for the sins of men. I'd be dying for my own sin. Christ came that he might live the perfect life and die the death for me and for you and for all who will. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. A willing, compliant, meek sufferer. He came to die. He could have, as he told Peter, called uh, legions of angels to come and but that was not his purpose. His purpose was to die for sin, the sins of men. He was taken, verse 8, from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. He says, um, he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence Neither was any deceit in his mouth. 
yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Why would it please the Lord to bruise his son? In view of the result that the price being paid that God might indeed forgive men. Let me, let me turn, if I might, quickly over to the book of, of Acts, the 8th chapter. Because this is a, a passage, of course, we remember well the story of the treasurer from Ethiopia who had come all the way to Jerusalem to worship. On his way back, through the providence of God, he is encountered by Philip, a great man, a Christian preacher of the gospel. And he hears, Philip hears this man reading the prophet Isaiah. A good-hearted man, obviously a devoted man, a reverent man, but a man who does not yet know Christ. And God is going to remedy that situation. And so in Acts chapter 8, we find this story. Verse 26, uh, the angel said to Philip, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that, is, that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit said to Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Philip ran thither and heard him reading uh, the prophet Isaiah. And he asked him, he said, you understand what you read? He said, how can I except some man should guide me? He desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Now the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment is taken away. And who shall declare his generation? for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Who's he talking about here? Mystery to him. Well, Philip opened his mouth and began at this same scripture and preached to him Jesus. I don't know exactly which prophets he went to, which scriptures he went to, but there are plenty to choose from. You can start in the book of, of Genesis and go all the way through the history. And there are hints and, and there are prophecies and there are arrows that point to the coming of Christ and his nature and the timing and the place. He preached to him Jesus. What's interesting is the next verse. And they went on their way. As they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, well, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Somewhere down the line, there was a connection made between the prophecies and the coming of Christ and his work and the, the, the necessity of being baptized. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, commanded the chariot to stand still. They both went down to the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And that man went on his way rejoicing. Philip had other work to do. This man did too, but now he was a Christian. He had learned the glorious news that the price had been paid for my sin, for our sin, by Christ. Let me go to the book of Romans, if I may. Romans chapter 3, and just briefly make this point. Romans 3, which had, the book of Romans has uh, so much to say about salvation. It's a glorious treatise on that subject, isn't it? And in Romans chapter 3, and beginning in verse 21, we find these familiar words, that the righteousness of the law, of God rather, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Let me just briefly make this point. You know, one of the first things, the keynote really of the book of Romans is in Romans 1.16. That is that uh, the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. The Jew first and also the Greek. There was a great deal of turmoil in the first century church about whether somebody could, could be, become a Christian just as a Gentile or had to, had to be a Jew first. The point that Paul made, and he made it strongly and he made it repeatedly in 2 Corinthians, in Galatians, and here in Romans, is that every man has the same problem, sin. And the solution is the same for every individual, Christ. 
whether they're a Jew or whether they're a Gentile, they all say the same way and they're all part of one body. There's not a Jewish church and a Gentile church. There's just one. That's still true. They're just Christians. Everybody's a sinner. Everybody needs to be saved. They're saved the same way on the same basis and that's the basis of Christ. So with that in mind, Paul's point is, no, they don't need to go back to the law of Moses and obey that to become a Christian. They can be saved where they are by Christ, through Christ. So, Romans chapter 3 and verse 21. Now the righteousness of the law, what God provides, the righteousness he makes possible. Without the law, outside of being a Jew, you can find Christ as a Gentile is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ upon all, under all, them that believe there is no difference. Verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That's an old word of propitiation we don't use much anymore, but it's the idea of an appeasement, of taking two that are separated and bringing them together, of reconciling. Uh, how is it that man can be reconciled to God with sin in his life? Well, the sin is removed by what Christ has done, by the grace that Christ provides. God has set this man forth, his son, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now why did he do that? Notice what he says. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, and he says to declare at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. Here we are, separated from God. And what separates us from God is our sin. Well, how can God uh, accept man who is a sinner? God couldn't do that and be just, could he? He couldn't look at a wicked man and say, oh, just forget it, come on. God must be just. If he's not just, he's not God. On the other hand, God did not wish to say, well, you, you earned it, you get it. Go to hell. Be lost. Go away. Be, be gone for eternity. God loves man. And so because of his great love for man, he doesn't want to just condemn man. But he can't accept him with his sin and be just. How do we reconcile this problem? Paul explains it here. How God can be just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. It's through what Christ has done. Christ paid the penalty for sin. And thus when a man comes to God through Christ, he comes and he is forgiven. God has, has met the, the, the terms of justice by paying the price for sin. And his great love is that which makes all this uh, work uh, to be his work. And uh, the trouble that he went through uh, as we would see it, would be worth it as far as he's concerned because he loves us so. Look in the sixth chapter of Romans in verse 1. Paul, a little later on in this book, writes, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We are buried with him by baptism through death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. Notice with me if you will. He says we're baptized into the death of Christ. What does he mean by that? What he means is that this erasing of sin that was made possible by the death of Christ becomes mine and yours when we're baptized into his death. Sin is there. But it doesn't have to be there for those who come to God through Christ. Those who are baptized into Christ. Those baptized into his death. That's when this great gift becomes effectual to you and me. That's when it applies to you and me. Christ takes to death for every man. 
but not all men receive forgiveness. Those who come to him in the way he's authorized, come in faith, come in repentance, they're baptized into Christ, and they're baptized into the death of Christ. Let me notice with you quickly one more passage in Ephesians chapter, uh, 1 Peter rather, chapter 1. And in verse 13, where Peter calls on us to be sober and to hope for the end, that the revelation of Jesus Christ is obedient children. He says in verse 17, if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges every, according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Look at verse 18. For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, silver and gold of your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with what? The precious blood of Christ, of a lamb without blemish, and without spot, who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Oh, what a price was paid that you and I might be forgiven. So let me, in closing, go back to Ephesians one more time and make the point, what power is involved in this act of God to remedy sin, my sin, and to restore fellowship with man. What power is involved in that? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, you that were dead in trespasses and sins. Somebody asked the question one time, said, you ever seen anybody raised from the dead? I've been to a few meetings uh, from our Pentecostal friends and they claim to work various miracles. I don't think I've ever seen anybody claim to raise somebody from the dead, but I've seen people raised from the dead and you have too. Every time somebody's baptized into Christ, they're redeemed from the dead. And, and I, don't, I hope it never loses its power to me of what it took for that to be true and for a scoundrel like me to be forgiven to go from being dead in trespasses and sins to the end of this chapter when he's talking about how that we are together built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, the temple of God. How do we get from the lowest of the low to that high? It was the power of God. It was also the love of God. In the third chapter, he says, I bow my knees, verse 14, unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We are all his family, if we belong to him. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is the length and breadth and depth and height and to know the love of God. Do you have any idea how much God loves you? Have we ever seen or thought about a love so great that this price would be paid, that this plan would be implemented and worked so that we, who is, so we're reading in Romans 5, we who were dead in trespasses and sin didn't know God didn't care that we might be redeemed. What love. And finally, what wisdom. What a plan. I never would have thought of that. How in the world could you remedy man from his sin? Looks hopeless to me. But it didn't look hopeless, thankfully, to God. Look with me in, in the third chapter of Ephesians. He talks about himself, Paul does, as being one redeemed. He, he says, I am less than the least of all saints. But I've been given the blessing to be able not only to be redeemed, but to preach that message of redemption among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The mystery was that hidden plan of God to save humanity from its own sin that men didn't see. The angels didn't see it. 
The devil didn't see it. But God worked this plan that all men might be saved. The mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things in Christ Jesus. Notice verse 10. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. I think I read Ephesians a few times before it finally dawned on me that when he talks about making known the wisdom of God by the church, he's not talking about the church going out and preaching to the world the wisdom of God. What he's saying is that not to human beings, but to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, to the angels, to the archangel, to the demonic powers, to the devil himself, the church, you and me as redeemed people, represent the culmination of a plan that was conceived and worked by God that leaves all in amazement. How in the world could God from wicked humanity draw out a people to be in fellowship with him? It came about because God's wisdom and love and power made it so. And all of the heavenly realm marvels at the wisdom of God. It's a great story. And I wish we had more time to emphasize it, but we'll have to close at this point. I, I thank you very much for your kind attention. I appreciate uh, your interest in this subject. It does help me, you know, if days ever do get, get long, difficult, to remember that you're special, that God loves you, that he's done so much more than we can realize to make it possible for you, for you to be his own, for you to have hope, there's there so many blessings, more than we can count, in being a Christian. I can't think of one good reason to not be one. And if you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, why not today make a change? Why not today make a start? And you come and you confess Jesus. I believe he's everything the Bible says he is. He's God who became man and lived for me and died for me and is raised to be at the right hand of God, interceding for me. I need his blood. I need to be baptized into the death of Christ. I, I leave that old sin life behind. I want to be his from now and whatever life God gives me. And you can start today, and you can have these blessings, and you can hold to them. If somehow they've become um, less meaningful to you, if you've, we've lost our way, then return to him he, you know, he wants to receive us. The only thing that separates me from God is my own stubbornness, just to put it bluntly. So why not today come to him? If we can help you in any way, let us know how, please, as we stand and as we sing. Will you?